Welcome to the Robert Schumann Center um, of Advanced Studies at the European University Institute. To those who are here in person and online, um, you are here for the incredible event, uh, News from the East, uh, Behind the Frontline in the Battle for Ukraine with Valerie Hopkins. Uh, this is a recorded event, so, so it's a hybrid event, and so we have some rules, particularly for the very numerous people who are online. Um, my name is Veronica Angel. I am a visiting uh, fellow here and a lecturer at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. Uh, my focus is on uh, democratization and European integration of Central and Eastern Europe. Um, and I'm, I'm really honored to welcome uh, Valerie Hopkins um, uh, to be with us today. So the rules are... Uh, the event is being recorded, so don't say anything that you don't want to be in, online forever. Um, for the those who are joining us online, please ask your questions in the Q&A box. And uh, when we start taking questions, um, I will moderate that conversation. Um, so I think that's all I was supposed to say in the, on the logistics side. Now going to the substance, I can't imagine a better way to celebrate Liberation Day in Italy than a conversation about um, the, uh, the front line in the battle for Ukraine. And uh, we have Valerie Hopkins with us today. She is the international correspondent for the New York Times uh, covering the war in Ukraine, as well as Russia and the countries of the former Soviet Union. So she is a journalist, but she's also an expert on all things uh, Russia related and, um, and beyond, because uh, Valerie has also began her journalistic career in Bosnia and Herzegovina, so um, at the local news outlet reporting on war crimes, trials, so that will come in handy in a future conversation about Russia, I suppose. Uh, she covered the Balkans in Eastern Europe for a decade, most recently for the Financial Times, before moving to Moscow to join the New York Times. Um, and among her many achievements, she's also uh, 20 22 recipient of uh, News Women's Club of New York's Mary Colvin Award for Foreign Correspondence. Um, and she was also part of a team that won a George Polk Award for Foreign Reporting for coverage of the war in Ukraine. And I'm pretty sure there are more awards and recognitions to come. So the reason we invited um, Valerie Hopkins to the um, Schumann Center at DUI is at least threefold. So first of all, we do not talk enough about the Russian society and its future um, after the, the conclusion of this war. So why do the Russian people continue to support Vladimir Putin? Was it at any point fair to ask of the Russian society or to expect of the Russian society uh, to, to start protesting um, against this um, increasingly totalitarian regime? And how does the Kremlin's propaganda about the war and not only affect everyday life in Russia, right? And how will, how will this society look like um, at the um, end of this war, however that end uh, will come about? I think that while the European research community and policymakers are focusing rightfully, but also in my view incompletely um, on uh, supporting Ukraine throughout the war, we are also very well placed to think about the reconstruction efforts. And to, in order to do that, uh, we would need to have experts who understand the trends and the attitudes in the Russian society as well. So that's the first reason why we have uh, Valerie with us today, so we can start that conversation. Secondly, to have access to that data, right? We would have to have information from you know, the people on the ground. And that is not the easiest thing for people like us to access um, because we are not there. So journalists and investigative reporters are hubs of information. They have dense networks uh, with the diplomatic community, uh, with um, uh, the civil society, with the policymakers on the ground, um, and they are a great resource, uh, if I can say that, also for us as well. And uh, I hope that this is not the last conversation that we have. Uh, with, with people who are uh, present in these uh, societies. And third, not last, I would argue that we need a bit of star power uh, to revitalize the conversation uh, about uh, Putin's real intentions in starting this war. 
uh, which was not always um, uh, very well guided uh, by uh, previous speakers, including in this um, in this halls. But first, um, Evan Greskovitz. So that's um, that's we're going to start with that. As you may all know, um, Evan Greskovitz was um, arrested, abducted, I would say, uh, by the Russian um, uh, regime at the end of. March, and he has now been detained, um, and uh, we don't really know that much about him. So how is Evan doing, and how has his arrest affected the way you can report from, from Russia from now on? Well, uh, thank you very much, Veronica, and thank you, Veronica and Eric, for, for inviting me here and uh, making me uh, comfortable in a room and a Zoom of uh, intimidating academics and intellectuals. I am not uh, an academic, and um, it is very nerve-wracking to be talking uh, to you uh, about my reporting, which is very unscientific and um, doesn't adhere to you know the proper polling methods and sampling size, et cetera. Uh, the only real value added that I have here is that I have been able to be in Russia for the past, uh, how many months has it been since August last year when I went back? Um, I, I started the year last year um, in January in, in Russia, and reported a lot on Kazakhstan. Then on Valentine's Day, I, I went to Ukraine and I covered uh, the first uh, five months of the war there until July. And then in August, I decided to go back. And I'm very glad that I was in Ukraine before going back to Russia, uh, just to have that perspective and, and understanding of what it actually felt like on the ground. Uh, but but first, uh, we did. I did want to talk about Evan. Uh, who uh, became one of my very closest friends in Moscow uh, while I was, uh, what, after I went back. As you can imagine, there were very, very few American journalists on the ground. I think there were fewer last year American journalists on the ground than, than even at the height of the Stalin era. Obviously, the circumstances in which we were reporting were very different. We didn't have to uh, go to a censor and fight for a space at the Telegraph to send you know, a heavily censored message back home. Um, but we did, you know, have, um, report under fairly difficult conditions, including quite a lot of surveillance. Um, Evan, um, greeted all of that with a sense of humor and, and a joke and, um, and, you know, despite being from probably the biggest single uh, newspaper competitor of the New York Times, uh, was very collegial, and um, especially because he had been he had been working in Moscow since 2017, and I only arrived in 2021, so I did not have a lot of time uh, to get to know Russia before the war started. I just want to show you briefly. Uh, the The Wall Street Journal has done an amazing job. If you even go to their homepage, um, they have. Uh, an entire um, landing section about Evan, who he is, um, where he comes from. There's a very moving um, interview with his family about, you know, their life. They are both, his parents are both immigrants uh, from the former Soviet Union who came to America in the late 70s. Um, and there's also a way that you can, if you so choose, after you read his fantastic reporting, to easily send him a letter in prison. Um, he has been getting hundreds of letters, uh, but uh, in, in letters that, that his group of friends have received, uh, he makes it very clear how meaningful and important each and every one of them is. So please have a look and, um, and consider sending him a message. Basically, uh, in Lefortovo prison, there's also an amazing story that his colleagues did about what it feels like in Lefortovo, which is a prison that's not run by his run by the Russian prison service. It's actually run by the FSB, the successor agency to the KGB. And uh, the main um, uh, the main goal there is to make um, inmates feel incredibly isolated from the outside world. Thus, I think there's a tiny window at the top where you can see a sliver of the sky. They let you out uh, for an hour to walk in a cage on the roof. Uh, and otherwise you're in a five by two a meter cell uh, with only one other inmate. Um, Evan did recently ask in his re most recent letter for a chess set and a, an instruction book about chess to, to um, learn how to beat his roommate. But um, otherwise he's also been reading quite a lot of books. So please, you know, uh, 
I think when Evan was arrested, there were only three American journalists, including me, in Moscow. The other one uh, being a reporter for National Public Radio. Um, and another journalist who was on holiday uh, for The Guardian, Andrew Roth, who's also an excellent journalist. I really recommend reading uh, their reporting because, uh, you know, Obviously, we are not on the front line in the war in Ukraine. Uh, we are not um, at risk of uh, of a missile strike, but it was, you know, very difficult to to do that reporting and done under a lot of duress. And and Evan especially felt a very strong commitment, uh, not only to to his readers, to his newspaper, but also uh, to the Russian people to um, to report honestly and accurately in a way that that can be hard to do from from abroad. Uh, most. Uh, newsrooms, including mine, uh, evacuated most of their staff uh, last March um, when very strict censorship laws were passed, including, you know, you can't call the war a war. You can't uh, publish any information uh, that's not published in an official Russian website like the Ministry of Defense. Uh, people have already gone to jail for eight and a half years uh, for quoting, uh, reporting from Associated Press in Mariupol from, from quoting the New York Times. Um, and so, you know, I don't know that any of us expected um, a charge for espionage, but we certainly thought that it would be possible to uh, be prosecuted for uh, spreading fakes about the, the Russian military, which was a law passed in March as well, or discrediting the Russian military. Um, yeah, so any way that you can spread news uh, at home, uh, if you're American, you know, contact your Congress people. Um, we really hope for, for a swift release because I do think every week, um, is harder and harder. So I thought um, to, to share a little bit about my experiences um, going back uh, to, to Russia and sort of how the situation on the ground has changed significantly uh, since, since I went back. What do you think about that? We can talk a bit about how, you know, when I first went back in, in August, um, basically, I'm just using these for, for props. Essentially, um, uh, the, gov the Russian government has made a big effort at the beginning to act like everything is fine. Um, I was pretty shocked uh, when I landed to see that the city was sort of blooming. The streets were were totally packed. There were sort of the performers everywhere. I remember feeling it was very surreal to see. I had never seen it before. A performer on the Moskva River on like a turbo jet dancing, you know, um, and having freshly come from Ukraine, it was, it was very jarring to see, you know, crowds cheering and clapping for, for this kind of, uh, vapid performance. Um, but, uh, and, and that is a really sort of a strategic, uh, effort on the part of the government to make everyone feel, and, and to a certain degree, that's still going on to make everyone feel like life is still normal, but it's not, um, slowly, you know, the war started to be felt more uh, in certain cities in Russia, uh, like like in Belgorod on the border, which is actually um, a trip that I made with Evan. He was he's very um, enterprising. He called me up and said, "We need to get to the border. The Ukrainian counteroffensive is happening, and people are streaming in." And I was like, "Okay, okay." He, he only called me because the journal said he couldn't go alone. So um, uh, I was very I was very glad uh, to do that because I did think it was very important not only to uh, see uh, a place in Russia where the war was being strongly felt, but also to talk to people that were coming out of uh, Russian occupied territory uh, in Ukraine um, and to, to get their perspective on, on what was going on and, and to see how, what the Russians were telling them about why they needed to evacuate to Russia, you know, how they were, what kind of messages they were giving and how they were trying to bind people uh, closely to them. Um, and then came the draft on September 21, uh, just five days after uh, my story from Belgorod published, uh, Putin announced uh, a draft, a call up of at least 300,000 men. We still don't know exactly. Um, I went to a draft office outside of Moscow and tried to talk to some of these guys about why they chose to comply with the draft summons. I actually did, did a podcast about it for our the New York Times podcast called The Daily. Um, uh, which was really focused on why why people were complying and and how families were taking it, and and this piece was really about you could feel finally the changes. A lot of men disappeared. People were hiding, uh, 
in their apartments or in their homes because uh, police officers were stopping people. They would go to all four exits, let's say, of a, of a Moscow metro and start asking men for, the, for their draft cards and uh, for their identity documents. So people were really hiding and you go to a restaurant and you see, wow, it's like mostly women. Um, that changed a little bit once it was announced that the draft was over, but, but it was the first time I think that many people could feel, th those who remained, uh, most everyone I knew already left, had already left in March and the second wave left around this time. Um, and then do you wanna jump in? Go ahead. I think it's, it's important to, to also look at the, the, this narrative um, arc from our perspective now, right? So one of the, uh, I'm just quoting from one of your articles, which I think you are gonna pull up right now, uh, one year into the war, Putin is crafting the Russia he craves. Um, and this is something you wrote on uh, February 19 with Anton Trojanovsky. Um, and just a quick quote, right? The grievances, paranoia, and imperialist mindset that drove President Vladimir Putin to invade Ukraine have seeped deep into Russian life after a year of war. A broad, if uneven, societal upheaval that has left the Russian leader more dominant than ever at home. So this is goes back to my initial you know, concern and questions that I'm sure are maybe shared by many of you, what exactly is Putin crafting, right? How does the, how does it look like um, on the ground? And what are the general attitudes that people are, um, are expressing? And there are many of us who are studying future trends and so on. And I think my question is to you, what kind of, what kind of questions should we ask? Where we should we look to understand uh, what kind of society is Putin um, um, building and shaping in, in Russia right now? Well, I think I think it's actually quite difficult to do that kind of work. I mean, there are uh, very few Russian pollsters who are who are looking at these issues, and um, you know, it's incredibly difficult now to to call someone up. You know, maybe in a focus group, but to call someone up and ask them to talk uh, about their opinion because of the repression, which I will start talking about, and uh, because of how pervasive now. Um, Mm, the fear is becoming in Russia. But uh, according to the most recent polls from the Levada Center, which is an independent uh, pollster in Moscow that probably many of you are familiar with, uh, about 20% of Russians are very supportive of the war, about 20% ad openly admit to despising the war and opposing it. Um, and there's a really, really big middle ground where you can see that people are sort of uh, kind of going along with the trend or they don't really know. I would meet a lot of people in the streets of Moscow and try to talk to them about this. And they were like, you know, we're not, even at the draft office, some of those guys said, well, we don't really know. Um, we don't, um, we're not informed. We don't have, we don't have a like decision-making capacities, but if our leaders chose to do this, maybe, maybe they had to actually this guy, uh, where is he? Uh, He's, a, he's the one who uh, I spoke to at length for, for the podcast version of the story. And he was sort of like, what are the Ukrainians actually, how are they gonna greet us? What do you think? How do they, um, what do they think about the war? I said, well, like I told him I was there and I said like, they don't really want you there. <laughs> Um, and he's, and, and we, you know, he went to a training camp and I was trying to follow up with him and he said like, soon this is going to be over and we're, everything's going to go back to the way it was before. We're all going to visit each other and everything, you know, so there are even some of the people fighting this have no idea kind of what they're really fighting for. And I think it's, it's very sad. I don't know, you know, how much he's now changed slowly, uh, throughout the course of his training, uh, period, his, uh, messages got more, um, his messages got more violent, I guess, in the sense of we're preparing, the enemy wants to kill us, we have to do this, you know, and, and but he was someone who, before he was drafted, was totally apathetic, totally uninvolved, and, and totally, you know, distant from, from even any wish or desire to uh, take any territory in Ukraine. So, um, and this is why I think it's so important to be there because there is an, an incredible uh, group of Russian, independent Russian journalists, uh, most of whom are in exile and they're still managing to do amazing work, but um, it very little can replace like just being there on the ground, talking to people in the street and, um, and at places like this. 
So maybe we can go a little bit deeper into some of the illustrations that you've been um, sharing with us throughout this, this, these last years. In the dictator's playbook, right, you've covered repression, crackdown on all sorts of dissent, but even, you know, simple protests that we've already um, uh, looked read about uh, the, the very young people who are being um, targeted in, in, in unbelievable ways. And this creates fear. You've also reported on the militarization of society, on the um, um, co-opting of um, major key, key figures in uh, the public space, like pop stars and, and, and others like this. So it seems like the whole dictator's toolbox is being deployed uh, to create a totalitarian regime that Putin can control. Um, can you just give us some of these examples? Because some of them are really strong, speaking of militarization. Yeah. Sure. So, um, I mean, a lot of this was already in motion uh, when the war started, but it's a process that's heavily accelerated. I think uh, curricula at all levels uh, in the past year from from pretty much uh, primary school until university have uh, have experienced a lot of changes. Um, students are from the first grade on are, are invited to something called uh, like the talking of lessons about important stuff and there uh, these lessons are meant to inculcate a sense of patriotism, loyalty, pride in Russia um, and uh, and and they vary um, uh, depending, of course, on the age level, they also started some, doing something which is not, which probably doesn't seem weird to Americans, but it is very weird to many Russians, which is every Monday, I think they start the school week by raising the Russian flag and singing the national anthem, um, which, which again, to many Russians is kind of anathema, but of course, to Americans is pretty normal. Um, and, and that was intentionally done to try and increase patriotism. Here you can see uh, a group of students, uh, like very young children brought to the World War II Museum, um, the Museum to the Great Patriotic Victory in Moscow, um, a victory, by the way, which they don't really talk about um, many Ukrainians support, supporting. Um, and uh, here the students are sort of uh, encouraged to act like soldiers. I witnessed some of them uh, like marching, be, being led in a march by their teacher, left, 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 right, left. Um, and you see uh, like every week, it seems like there's another military festival. We went even when everything was normal uh, in August to to a tank biathlon uh, where we, we saw you know many young children shooting guns. Uh, schools are now offering uh, classes um, in in handling weapons and um, and and slowly but surely also uh, other parts of the curricula are being rewritten. I think just this week there was news that um, connection to to, to Kiev and um, the you know history of Kiev and Rus is, is being taken out of Russian curricula and they don't want to um, give Russian children any sense that um, uh, actually some the there was that Kiev and Rus was was uh, really a proper city uh, and capital before Moscow even existed. So here you can see a lot of photos from our great photographer Nana Heitman um, yeah who has a tremendous eye for for capturing these things. Um, what else is in the in the militarization of society? Well, so that that comes along with uh, protests and and suppression of of dissent. So uh, most of my friends back home, I'm from Washington D.C., are always saying like, "What's going on? Any sign of protest? When are we going to see the people rise up?" Um, and um, it's a very it's a I, it's a very hard question to answer because. Um, about 20,000 people have been arrested. The, there's a great uh, NGO called Ovede Info, which keeps track of this stuff. Um, about 20,000 people have been protested for uh, anti-war protests since February 24th. They've been pretty sporadic, uh, uh, mostly in the first few days uh, after the war started and then um, after the mobilization was announced. Uh, but, but, but here and there, we also see quite a lot of protests. And um, most of those people will have gotten a fine and up to two weeks in jail. But you see that there's also 527 uh, suspects and convicts in anti-war criminal cases, uh, which carry a sentence of up to 10 years in prison, I think, at least. 
Um, so this is a pretty high number of people who are sitting in jail for their anti-war and political convictions. Um, but we do see that some events have had the um, have had the ability to to I pull it up yes to galvanize uh, to galvanize ordinary people. So in January, after a missile strike on the Ukrainian on a on a residential building in the Ukrainian city of Dnipro, which killed a lot of people, uh, it brought out a lot of Muscovites who had not. And also, actually, there were protests. I think in twelve other cities in Russia. Uh, brought out a lot of Russians who um, had previously stayed silent. We, I interviewed uh, one of these women, Katya, who um, actually had worked for Gazprom before the war, like since she graduated from college. Uh, she quit in December. This was in January. And um, after the missile strikes, she said, I just can't take this anymore. Like we are all enabling this because of our silence and our fear. She went out uh, to a statue of a Ukrainian poet uh, with a sign that said, Ukrainians are, are not our enemies, they're our brothers. This was, the, her protest actually was, didn't get, um, was not looked upon so favorably in Ukraine. Um, but she, she was arrested um, and, and she spent 12 days in jail for this. And, you know, what I met her after she came out of jail and she kind of said like, what do I do now? You know, I really, I knew I really needed to do this, but if I do this again, then I will face 10 years in jail as well. And I'm not sure that I'm, you know, ready to like not see my grandparents again, to not see uh, my husband, my relatives, et cetera. So um, people are faced with a, with a very difficult choice um, in terms of, of, uh, whether or not they are going to to protest or or speak out, um, I think that the 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 penalties for doing so have continued to widen. So I reported as well about a nineteen year old girl who had um, she was a, she is a, was a student in Arkhangelsk, a city in northern Russia near the Arctic Circle, and uh, around Victory Day, May 9th, she uh, went out and. Uh, plastered the city with uh, flyers saying, uh, you know, Ukrainians uh, fought in, in with us in World War II, and now we're bombing them. Um, and she, and now they're being killed by us. Um, she, uh, the next day, police came to her house. Uh, they forced her to record uh, an apology video to Russian soldiers. Um, and they told her, you know, if you do anything, they gave her a fine. Um, so this was her first offense. Uh, and they said, if you do anything else, uh, we will, you'll go to jail. Uh, so she, she also stopped. She's a first year student. She's trying to get an education. And, um, but she did continue posting on her private personal closed Instagram, which Instagram and like Facebook is banned in Russia. Uh, but many people still use it with the help of a VPN. Uh, and what she didn't know was that a group of her classmates, uh, had set up a chat, uh, where they were looking for people who, uh, who don't support the war. Um, and someone sent a screenshot of her, of an Instagram post she wrote on October seven or eight, which was right after the Ukrainians, uh, successfully bombed the bridge connecting Russia with Crimea, which had illegally annexed in 2014. Um, and she said, you know, guys, let's talk about why it is that Ukrainians are happy about this bombing. Uh, let's, you know, let's examine what 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 we're doing to Ukraine. So um, according to screenshots of the chat, you know, there was a very short discussion, like, should we report her? Somebody said, yes, like, this is definitely a criminal. Um, and someone else said, like, denunciation is the duty of a patriot. So these are like 19, 20 year old university students. Um, and so they did. And in December, um, just before the new year, actually, uh, police uh, came to her house, right? Police, somebody pushed her on the floor, held a sledgehammer above her head, told her she was going to die and never see her family again. And eventually she was uh, charged with um, not only discrediting the uh, armed forces of the Russian Federation, but also uh, justifying terrorism. Uh, so here she is in, in court, um, this was a hearing that that I attended to where she was arguing that she should not be under house arrest, uh, which she had been in um, 
already for a month. So uh, she actually um, had the luck to escape. There is a small underground railroad for anti-war activists uh, that is getting getting people out of Russia. Uh, but you know, even and even in her situation, she's young. She can adapt, um, but she still ha it's still very difficult. She has to start over. Um, she you know, doesn't speak in the language besides Russian. She doesn't have any clothes. She doesn't know, you know, well, clothes are fine, but she doesn't know if she'll ever see her, her relatives and family again. Again, I don't want to um, underemphasize uh, the experience of millions of Ukrainians who are fleeing from, from bombs. Um, but, um, but, you know, it's, this is just one example. And um, there are more and more of them now. I think in, in March, in early March, there was a man detained on the Moscow Metro because his neighbor uh, reported him for uh, having pro-Ukrainian content on his phone. And uh, I don't really understand how he was able to report it in a way that the police could then detain him at the Metro, but this guy spent a few weeks in, in, in jail as well. And one of the more extreme cases, um, uh, refers, pertains to a father whose uh, daughter, uh, maybe you, some of you have already heard about this, um, uh, a single dad whose father wrote a, uh, made a drawing in our class, she was 12. She made it, this is not the drawing, but she, she made a drawing um, saying, uh, no, I think they were, they were given an assignment in class to like many art classes across Russia uh, to send a letter in support of the Russian troops or to, you know, uh, make a pro-war slogan. And she wrote, sort of, she drew a photo of two, you know, a mother and a daughter wearing Ukrainian colors with a, with a missile falling on them with a, with a Russian flag next to it. And she wrote no to war. Uh, and uh, she she was uh, reported to the authorities uh, by uh, we don't the administrator of the school denies it but um, she was reported um, the the FSB interrogated both her and her father and eventually they found two posts on his social media um, that were against the war and basically uh, they. They were in the process of. of uh, they took her away. They took, they took, they, mm -hmm. he lost custody of her. And because, you know, he was a single dad and the mother was not in the picture, she was placed in an orphanage and he was placed under house arrest and forbidden from seeing her. Uh, we don't really know what's going to happen with this story because he, uh, he escaped also using this underground railroad, but he turned on his phone in Minsk uh, and was caught and is uh, in the process of being brought back to Russia. I'm not sure I want to uh, discuss um, in great detail this underground railroad. Maybe we should leave it no. uh, undiscussed. Uh, and I don't have anything to say. <laughs> I don't know about it. No, but it, that, that does make me think about um, something else that you've also reported on, um, and it's in connection to this. It's not just the imperialist mindset that seems to be guiding um, um, Vladimir Putin and his in in in, in this war, uh, but it's it's a fight against democracy. Right. He was quoted saying that liberalism is obsolete um, and um, there is also, you know, his major fight uh, seems to be not just to um, to to expand uh, his um, uh, paranoid Im empire, but um, also to secure his position, right, to make sure that democracy is not spreading. Uh, and this is also from uh, one of your articles uh, where you uh, quote the ultra-conservative business tycoon Konstantin Nailoleas. I'm sure these are great conversations. Malafeyev. Yeah. Okay, Malafeyev. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, he says that um, liberalism in Russia is dead forever, thank God, uh, he bragged in a phone interview. Uh, the longer this war lasts, the more Russian society is cleansing itself from liberalism and the Western poison. Um, so this is, um, again, seems to also be this, this disdain of democracy and anything that has to do uh, be connected to democracy is also shared by the elite around, um, around the Kremlin. And it's... Um, that's also something very important. And you brought up the Ukrainians. I just returned from a short visit to Ukraine, talking to civil society um, and also representatives of the government. And even as their, the whole society is geared for, for war and in defense of their country, they still find time to 
criticize the government, right? So even now they, they would still talk about, you know, oh, we should be careful about media freedom. Uh, we should make sure that this, you know, this is temporary. We should have elections, um, uh, have opposition represented. So there is a concern, even if the priority is winning the war, about how are we going to develop a society that is pro pro democratic and and European and um, takes on social liberal values. This does not seem to be the case in in Russia, but also from what you're saying, there's no space for that either. And the the elite is on board, and so there's where's this, is there any kind of um, glimmer of, of hope that you see on, on the street that we can collaborate with? I know I'm putting you on the spot here, but how do we solve it? <laughs> I mean, I have to say I was surprised by the amount of people, mostly in Moscow, but not only, uh, who would silently tell me, like, I hate this, please, in your, you know, in your reporting, show that, you know, not all Russians support this. Our, we feel ashamed. Our heart is breaking every day. We don't know what to do. We feel totally powerless. And um, a surprising number of people also, like, thanked me as an American journalist for, for being in Moscow. I, I, di I didn't expect so much of that. Um, there are still, every day I had talks with people who, who, who hate what's going on, although I also had talks with people who, who are enthusiastically uh, supporting it, like like Malafeyev, who who really hopes that the war goes on for for a very long time, because the longer it goes on, you know, the the, the more people will choose to settle abroad, will leave, will be put in jail, and and the more afraid people will be to have another opinion. But to to your earlier comment, I think um, the Kremlin, you know, ha has made a very big effort to. Uh, show that Russian civilization is a unique independent civilization and, and mostly um, define itself in opposition to uh, the Western values that, that we by and large have agreed to. So that's why um, in, uh, in the middle of like the really difficult, the really kind of botched mobilization process and the, um, you know the the very embarrassing counter uh, for Russia counteroffensive uh, that that where Ukraine was able to uh, push back the Russian troops. Uh, the the Russian Parliament, the Duma, found it um, important to uh, enact a law um, to completely ban what it calls oh did I do? LGBTQ propaganda. Um, so there was already a version of this ban in place uh, since 2012 or 2013 against um, propaganda. Uh, to minors about LGBTQ rights, uh, but this basically, the law basically forbids any sort of public mention of any queerness or any any gayness. So uh, people are very concerned about, um, you know, what happens to this community, but it's, it's, just, an, it's just one example of um, how Putin is trying to refine a society that uh, is only um, only hues to, to patriarchal, traditional, orthodox uh, Russian values. So my last question before we start opening this conversation um, it would be about the perception of of the West also since the start of the of the war, right? So we clearly there is this. Um, antagonistic um, world, you know, manichaic, which in the in in the eyes of Putin would put them right on the right side uh, that he is building. Um, there is there are parts of the society that are supporting it, and then parts that are um, afraid to speak out, which is not something that uh, we can judge, I suppose, that much given the constraints that you've presented to us. Um, then there's again the elite that doesn't seem to be moving um, in in any kind of um, dissenting direction. Um, so how are any how is anything from the West, let's put it like that, uh, European journalism, uh, American journalism penetrating at all in the society? In our conversations, you're also saying that because of the sanctions, you cannot make so the New York Times cannot make money in Russia, so you've taken down the paywall, right? So does that mean that people have more access to uh, these sort of news that you guys are also reporting on? And is that is there any influence do you see that is positive from the West? 
Well, I don't know that a significant number of people are reading us, but actually, but the New York Times did start a telegram in February last year. And uh, I did actually meet some young people who said, like, we follow it. Thank you. You know, this is the only thing I, you know, can can trust and read. But by and large, I don't think um, uh, a significant number of Russians are, are reading us or um, any number of the Western media outlets uh, who are who are who are, are continue to be present in Russia, uh, but I think uh, I think one of the things that has been very sad for me is to see uh, on uh, across um, many sectors a real uh, dis disappointment in Europe. Um, Russian propaganda uh, y uses uh, quite often selectively um, uh, videos of of Western leaders. Uh, railing against Russia with good reason, um, criticizing the government, et cetera. But I remember, you know, I like it was kind it's kind of amazing to see how many people watched the Munich security conference in Moscow. I got into a taxi and uh, uh, was uh, trying to to talk to the driver. What do you think? You know, he, he was very supportive of the war. And he said, you know, this is all confirmation that they just hate us. I said, they didn't hate you for a long time. You know, they were buying all of your gas. They were trading with you, you know, only when you invaded your neighboring country and started killing people. Um, uh, you know, they started to get pretty upset. And he said, did you watch the Munich security conference? You know, this, you know, uh, I'm trying to remember now which, which leaders he mentioned, but I, you know, and that was something, you know, that during the day in my office, I had been watching how, um, uh, videos of the speeches of the conference were played over and over and over on the Russian propaganda channels, uh, which is by the way, the only thing, uh, you can watch besides, um, I think there's a Christian channel as well. Evan's been watching in jail a, a cooking show of monastery cooking. Um, but but by and large, there's not uh, a lot of variety um, available besides this propaganda. Um, and, and I think that that has really sunk in, this idea that uh, th this constant message from the Kremlin that the West you know, was always afraid of us because we're so big and important and they, you know, they wanted to, to destroy us. And we, you know, I've heard it from, from many ordinary people that we were a, a, an American colony for 30 years and now we're free, um, which is something that's really, really hard to hear and really hard to um, uh, push back against. Um, but, you know, there are also progressive Russians who feel disappointed in the West. Um, uh, people who are angry that, you um, they never voted for Putin. They um, they always protested, uh, you know, when they could for years. They went to every protest, and now, you know, the West sort of put up its hands and said, "Okay, well, this is only your fault, and only you can fix this." When it was, in fact, you know, uh, Western European companies buying gas, uh, trading with Russia, um, you know, continue moving forward with Nord Stream two, et cetera, um, that was that was funding the regime, even I think selling um, uh, equipment to the to the Russian riot police that was being used to, to beat protesters. Um, and so many people. Uh, feel frustrated. Um, obviously, it's very difficult to um, come up with a system about, you know, which Russians um, can and should, I don't know, have the ability to travel abroad or not. Um, I, for one, have been really frustrated and disappointed when on my flights into Russia, I see, you know, people coming back with like Prada bags. And you see that, you know, the planes are always full of of wealthy uh, Russians traveling and enjoying Europe, despite uh, the restrictions that are in place. Um, but but there are also people who um, who definitely I think I mean it's a minority, but but who definitely also feel abandoned uh, by the West. So I think across the spectrum, uh, negative uh, feelings. Well, I think it's it's maybe safe to say that um, this. Um, this is still ongoing. So there, there are still companies and banks that are still funding the regime. Um, the sanctions, many of them are targeting um, ordinary people. And uh, well, that was also part of the strategy, but that those sanctions have been incomplete when it comes to targeting uh, the important people that you've also uh, referred to. Um, so this is not time to maybe bash the European Union or uh, what, what they've been doing, but there's definitely room for improvement um, in how this whole situation is being handled as well in the West and the lack of strategy and, and is definitely one of them. Okay, so um, I'm going to stop now and um, start getting questions from you guys. I hope that we can open this uh, conversation far and wide, and I will take down names. Do you want to take one question at a time, or maybe have 
three together and um, three is fine. There are, yeah. Well, we'll we'll prioritize um, um, our guests. Um, so, Marina, uh, thank you, I'm Marina Kedaj. I'm on a fellow. I'm from Ukraine, and actually, I was within that situation when uh, Russia started her vast aggression, and I felt it. <laughs> so, my question is uh, is as following: um, It is true that Russia now is inventing new anti-totalitarian ideology, shifting the power of law by the law of power, and ordinary Russians like to repeat it very often. Uh, why, uh, why you continue this war? Because we are more powerful than you are. Um, that is the only reason, no, no logical, no logics at all. Uh, you have spent many months in Russia and you should feel, and this is to my question, uh, how do you feel? Are there any weak points in this new ideology? How do you feel it? Um, even sometimes it is not possible to, uh, to rationalize it, to explain it to, uh, with uh, some reasons, but, but maybe you feel it somehow. What are the weak points and how can, we, uh, how can uh, civilized society interfere to influence ordinary Russians? Because I think that we can influence only from beneath, from below. Uh, how, how can you explain it? Thank you. Alexander Moise, Research Fellow at the UI. Uh, thank you so much for your work, Valerie. I wonder if you could tell us a bit about the state of uh, foreign media in Russia right now. Are there any journalists left? And uh, what what are we losing? <clears throat> what are we losing by not having journalists there? Uh, what kind of information, um, um, you know, on the elites, on any any cracks in the regime? Are we, are we just completely in the blind or do we still have any option to understand what's going on uh, on the ground? Thank you. So um, Valerie, thank you so much. Um, I, uh, I was struck by the first image that you showed the Moscow street scene, um, the marching band that is, is playing uh, has much more ethnic diversity than this room. Uh, and, and so my question is, um, is this new Russia a Russia that, that is unconcerned with ethnicity or is it a, a Russia that has also got an ethnic cleavage to it that, that we should pay attention to? Um, uh, that's a great question. This is actually um, a photo from the Spaskaya Bashnya festival. Uh, it's held annually on Red Square. It's a festival of marching bands. I think there's like 10 or 12 different Russian military bands. Um, and every year they have uh, foreign guests. So um, I, in fact, I think like Britain participated at one point before they, th that all stopped um, after 2014. But uh, I, I cannot remember that this year uh, there was Egyptians, a uh, couple of people from South America, a couple of gr groups from South America uh, and a couple from Asia as well. This, I think they, they were playing Katyusha um, and the Russian crowd was going wild. Um, I do think so. So uh, there is a question about ethnic diversity, but just, uh, First, to say that uh, you know Russia has been working very hard to court allies uh, from the non-Western world and to depend on them and to say like actually the majority of the world is with us, not Ukraine. Um, you know the by population, you know, the, the, the world is on our side. Um, and I think, you know, they've used uh, their long time uh, net diplomatic networks in these countries and also uh, military and economic uh, uh, ties to, to try and do that. And it's a big, you know, that's something that now, you know, people in the foreign policy establishment in Moscow are, are bragging about. Like we, we, you know, I've been to Italy a million times. We don't need that anymore. We, we have plenty of allies in the rest of the world. And we know, you know, Russia is buying drones from Iran, um, uh, leaning on, on President Lula in Brazil, who, you know, came, whose foreign policy advisor came to Russia and did not go to Ukraine. Um, and they're really trying to, to, to build up those alliances. So that's what it is. So the minority, um, uh, it's a really complicated question in Russia because, um, and I'm far from an expert on that, but, uh, um, you know, it's very interesting because, um, 
uh, many of the soldiers who first signed up as contractors to fight uh, and later were mobilized uh, come from a marginalized minority communities in Russia. And, and Putin made a weird speech or he made a speech uh, in which he uh, started listing some of in, in, in March, where he started listing like I am Buryat, I am Chechen, I am Ingush. I'm he 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 rattled off a long uh, list of of uh, minorities to say that like you know we are this diverse uh, country and you don't have to be ethnically Russian to be Russian and to be part of the Russian world. You just have to speak Russian and and be loyal to this country. Uh, at the same time. Um, most movements for um, increasing, uh, you know, knowledge of, of ethnic minority languages in Russia or, you know, ethnic culture are, are decreasing. So there's a weird kind of instrumentalization, I would say, of, of, of ethnic minorities. In fact, I talked yesterday at Veronica's class at Sais Bologna about um, one popular singer called Shaman, uh, who sings this kind of pop anthem. I have, I did a story about it, but I didn't, I don't know why I didn't pull it up. Um, he, he, his song, I'm Russian Yaruski became kind of one anthem of a uh, wartime Russia. Uh, and on um, National Unity Day, uh, they filmed like the, the official, I don't know, TV filmed videos of all the Russian regions and many minorities in their ethnic costumes, uh, singing and dancing to I'm Russian in Russian. Um, I, I hope that answers the question a bit. So the second question this I'm going backwards, the state of foreign media in Russia. Um, there are actually a lot of foreign journalists still there. It's much, uh, much, much less than, than before. Um, the way it works now is whereas before um, we got visas uh, for a year, well, I got one visa for a year, but the foreign correspondents in general were, got accreditation and then a, a, a visa on that basis for a year. Uh, since the war, you can extend your visa um, only by three months every time. And you have to be physically present in the country. So if you weren't there, say, I know I have a lot of uh, colleagues whose visas expired in February, March, April, when they weren't sure whether they should go back or could go back. Um, and they expired, you have to start again. Um, and the Russians are not really giving new accreditation. So, you know, Evan and I always felt, okay, we're grandfathered in. It's, you know, for whatever reason, you know, we have this ability to be here and, and we should be here. Um, but uh, Europeans uh, remain. So, you know, the Le Monde, uh, French TV, a lot of German correspondents are on the ground. Austrians, um, there are really a lot. Um, and they're doing great work. And I think we're gonna be depending uh, more and more on European sources of news inside of Russia. Um, yeah, but, but it's, but of course it's significantly less. And I think that this arrest, uh, of Evan has, will have a chilling effect on, uh, on all of them, you know, uh, people can see that, uh, working on certain topics or being too bold will, will land you in jail. And what the European, uh, embassies tell their correspondents is like, unlike America, we don't do prisoner exchanges. So there's nothing, there's not very much we can do for you. Um, and the third question that is is really, really hard to answer. Thank you for it. Um, I think that, I think that the, the cracks are, are only going to come with time. You know, I, I, I noticed in my conversations with people that I felt that they would complain about the economy or insist that everything was the same as before, depending on, on whether or not they supported the war and, and, and whether or not they supported Putin. Um, the economy has done incredibly well. I know this is not part of the ideology, but, but it's uh, something that, that many people in Russia where 30% of the population don't have indoor toilets, you know, are concerned about. Um, and the other thing I think is, is, um, is how much you know, how, how close the war touches people. I mean, in Ukraine, like there's not a single person whose life is not touched by this war. In Russia, there are still people who are able to sort of uh, stay away. I remember on the anniversary of the war, I, I went to Red Square this year, it's a holiday. And I spoke to a couple from, I think they were from Yekaterinburg. And I said, oh, you know, hello, my name is Valerie. You know, um, um, you know, do you know what day it is today? The 24th of February, does that day mean anything to you? Oh yeah, the beginning of the special military operation, uh, as Russians call it. And you know, does this affect your life? Well, not really," said this married couple. One of the women said, uh, "The the wife said th they have a a store. They had a, have a store for children's clothes. I think." And she said, "Oh my God!" She said, um, 
yeah, there was this time when we we couldn't buy white paper. We had to use yellow paper. Uh, but uh, you know, it was so there was a sh- crazy shortage. But that's fixed. We solved everything. It was like the masks with COVID. Everything passed, um, and that was um, you know uh, mid forties or early fifties uh, reaction to the word. Do you have friends fighting? No, not really. Um, and I, I spoke to then two younger guys, and I said, you know, what's going on? They were from Arul. And they said, um, they said, you know, they had a one or two friends who had been called up, um, but, uh, you know, they would do it too, probably, but they didn't really expect to. And I said, you know, I started to ask them, you know, what news do you watch? How do you get your information? Are you worried? How do you feel when you hear about Bucha? And one guy turned to the other and said, what is that? And the other guy said, oh, well, that's the propaganda from the West, you know, well, the West claims this, but, you know, we know it's like this. Um, and and this was really um, quite shocking. So uh, to see that that, I mean, maybe the guy didn't want to talk about Butcha, but uh, I kind of believed that he didn't really know. It doesn't. They don't show it on TV. It's not accessible online anywhere. Um, and so I think that there are a lot of people who just choose to to stay uninformed and and try to go about their daily lives. But I will say that um, I went to also the day before that. Um, the day before that, I went to a massive rally uh, that that Putin held uh, for between eighty and one hundred thousand people in in Russia's biggest stadium, Luzhniki, uh, and it was meant to sort of just be a sign of support for the war. And you know, there were a lot of people that were forced to go there by their state employers, but there were a lot of people waving flags and dancing to shaman um, uh, and and other. Uh, really nationalistic uh, musicians, including people who rapped about, you know, having their elbows up in blood and and um, uh, rap, rapped also about uh, the siege of Mariupol, the siege of Azovstal, um, right before they brought a group of children that um, had uh, been brought from Mariupol to Ukraine on the stage um, and had them thank uh, the Russian soldier who had saved them. Um, and afterwards, uh, it, as you can imagine, as an American journalist, it was um, pretty intimidating uh, to be there, but I did talk to people. And afterwards, I, I spoke to one young woman who said, you know, I said, you know, how do you feel? And she acknowledged um, the, the, the first thing she said, sort of acknowledged the fact that this was all stage managed for Putin to, to feel support. But she said, like, it was pretty nice. Like, it's almost as if everyone wanted to be there, she said. Uh <laughs> Uh, but then, uh, you know, I said, so, you know, what do you think about the special military operation? And she said, um, well, you know, I, I think it was good. Um, you know, I have friends from Donetsk and, you know, they've been suffering for, for eight years and it's not right. And so we should have done it sooner. And then she sort of, you know, realized I'm not Russian and asked me more about who am I and where am I from? And, and finally she said, you know, I wish that this had ended sooner because, um, you know, so many people are, have died by now. There's not, you know, there's not a family that's not touched by this now. And the longer it goes on, you know, the 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 more it will be for people. So, unfortunately, you know, humanitarian arguments and 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 deaths and and um, and destruction of Ukraine is not something that 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 ordinary Russians seem to really care that much about. But uh, of course, what they do care about is um, how it's touching them and how many people are dying. And so I could see from her, she seemed really to me to be one of these people in the middle, neither 20, not from neither end of the 20 percents that I mentioned, who kind of, you know, as this as this wears on, would start probably to question it more. But um, uh, I also expected to find that uh, in a city um, that has lost many of its uh, many of its soldiers. I went to Ryazan last year in December, uh, which is home to an elite uh, group of paratroopers, and I, we actually just encountered a mother of a soldier um, uh, at the at the at the military portion of the cemetery. Mm, her son had died in the first three days of the war as they were trying to um, in the battle for Hostomel Airport. Um, I was in Kiev at that time, and it was really um, strange to to talk to her and to you know 
conceive of her son, like being there part of this route to kill. And she, you know, she also said, you know, well, I wish they planned it better, but she, but she, she supported the war. Um, and I think that uh, my colleague, Andrew Roth also did a similar story in Samara uh, where he also talked to relatives of the dead who um, I think needed, need to find some meaning, some reason, some value in, in the death of their child. And that's something that uh, Svetlana Alexievich also wrote a lot about in the war, uh, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. So um, it does seem very difficult, but I do think that as this goes on, uh, uh, um, slowly people will will start to 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 oppose it more than they do now. And at what incredibly great cost, um, Olena? And and yeah, thank you very much, Valerie, for your insights. Uh, Olena Sneher from Kiev, uh, Jean Monifio here. Uh, I have two can I ask two questions? <laughs> okay, so my first question is, question is about um, Russian uh, immigrants uh, in the in the world in different countries. Uh, you you've mentioned that uh, those who protest against the war or feel like they they are against the war are minority in Russia. So those who there there is a quite a big group of people who chose to protest by feet, yeah? like just leaving the country. Um, so do you think that uh, they could do more actually, because there are no anti-war protests by Russians uh, around the globe in different countries. I have observed some protests of Russian indigenous people like Burats and Bashkirs and Tatars in uh, in small, like all those small nations, small ethnic groups uh, in different countries. Uh, they also are present uh, like in European capitals and in, in the US, but they are very, very small and almost invisible. So uh, do you think that uh, like anti-war, anti-Putin, anti-Russian uh, Russian regime, current regime protest among Russian immigrants, massive protest could show also the world the strong message that uh, the society doesn't, Russian society doesn't support this war, doesn't support this regime, doesn't like this regime. And that, that can somehow convince also those uh, pro-Russian groups in European countries and in the West and among the globe, especially in Africa and Latin America and in Asia, that, yeah, Putin is not proposing something uh, positive, yeah, some, some positive agenda for the globe against uh, Western liberal democratic values. This is the first question. And the second question is, before the war, just before the war, a few weeks before the war, um, uh, there were also uh, some observations from not only from Ukrainians, but from Western observers who monitored Russian media. Uh, they said that <clears throat> a few weeks before the war, uh, there, were, there were like very strong propaganda directed uh, uh, dehumanizing Ukrainians. Uh, especially like de dehumanizing Ukrainians, not anti-Ukrainian, not pro pro war, but de dehumanizing. Uh, right now, uh, I'm watching also Russian TV uh, in small portions, of course, with the desecration process. After all, but but what I observe, and maybe I I would like to ask you if you if you notice it also. Uh, this they started in in the, in the state Russian TV dehumanizing other European nations like Polish uh, nation uh, Baltics especially but also some sometimes it sounds uh, this dehumanizing rhetoric uh, it's uh, it can be noticed also against some other like German yeah but but less but mainly by mainly neighbors so do you also notice it. I will add a, a question here um, from um, uh, a person online, Ian Bond, um, who is asking something that connects to Olena's questions as well um, about the, the tone, the genocidal tone and content of some of the propaganda. So it's um, 
um, it also connects with the, the human aspect of, of um, dehumanizing Ukrainians that is also taking place right now. Ivo was next. Um, hi, uh, Ivo Iliev, PhD candidate here at UI. Thank you, Valerie, for your work. Um, so two questions. One is um, in Russian um, liberal discourse right now, uh, there is a lot of talk about uh, generational cleavage in Russia, uh, with all the blame being put on the boomers who are like those, you know, socialized in Soviet times that absorb all the propaganda uh, and that kind of shared regimes, cannibalistic views, etc. Whereas the young people rather tend to not care about Ukraine so much, and for them the uh, independence of Ukraine is, you know, just as big deal as the independence of Ethiopia, whatever. But I don't really buy this. Um, I lived in Russia shortly after the Maidan, and my Rush, young Russian colleagues uh, were in their vast majority denying Ukrainians like a separate ethnic, cultural, national identity or a right to statehood. So um, I would be interested in what your observations are, like in Russian society at large, if you observe such a gener generational cleavage or not. And the second thing is, I would be interested in what, um, if you've come across what Russians, um, reverend Russians think of Wagner, uh, especially given the fact that Wagner is recruiting murderers and rapists from prisons. And if they survive the six, six month meat grinder, they're being released and sent back to Russia and they can just walk around, you know? There was this, this uh, reportage about a guy that killed like 50 women and he's going to be sent to Ukraine now. And then if he survives, he's just gonna walk the streets of Moscow. Um, how are people feeling about this? Thank you. Okay, so, yeah. Thank you. I don't know why, again, I'm starting from the end. I hope you don't mind. Um, I do think there are a lot of people in Russia who are very worried about uh, what happens when uh, a group of heavily armed and likely very traumatized people uh, return uh, to a society that uh, will not necessarily be orderly, but will be quite chaotic and, and difficult. Uh, we've, we're already seeing now, I think yesterday I saw in the news that a, a former uh, soldier killed his grandma in a drunken fight. Uh, there are a number of, 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 of stories like this kind of anecdotally coming out every few days. Um, and that's, you know, even before uh, a big return of, of soldiers. Um, I think certainly there is uh, a, a big concern about, about murderers and rapists uh, being released, especially after serving six years. My colleague, Neil McFarquhar, did a great story about how uh, many communities are divided over where to bury uh, the people, you know, so let's, so does, does someone who, you know, uh, killed his neighbor in a, in a drunken fight deserve to be buried in an alley of heroes, which are increasingly, uh, popping up in, in various cities of Russia. Um, and, 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 and people are really divided about that. Uh, many people, especially those who remember the crimes are saying, appealing to the local authorities saying, no, like, please don't do this. But, but others, um, uh, but others say, well, he fought for Russia, so, you know, he deserves a hero's burial, as if this is a, a redemption. Um, uh, I did also um, go to a Wagner graveyard. Um, uh, sorry, I don't know where it is. Here we go. Um, again, with Nana, who made uh, very powerful photos, and um, many of the the, the Wagner soldiers uh, who die are actually, you know, many of them don't don't have relatives. Um, they uh, or or their relatives, you know, were not ready, or they were not ready to ask their relatives to take on the the cost of uh, burying them. So uh, Wagner. Um, has erected, this is in Krasnodar, there's another one outside of Yekaterinburg that, that people just recently found out about. Um, and actually, um, there was a very incredible activist that I interviewed for the story who sort of uh, has been, was going to all of the cemeteries in this region, in the Krasnodar region, 
uh, and trying to keep uh, tabs on how many people had died because he said, you know, this is the only way that we can turn people against the war. And he was an older guy and his, uh, his friend, so the, he was, here's a boomer who's very anti-war. Uh, and his friend said, you know, this was the only thing that made a difference. You know, this is when, why people rose up against the czar hundred years ago. Um, and uh, Vitaly Watanovsky, uh, who I quote here, who was doing this. We, so we, when we came, there was a funeral for nine people. Um, and we were told that every day uh, they were burying up to 11 people in just this one uh, cemetery. And there, there, there were many of them. But uh, Watanovsky just had to flee um, uh, like a, less than a month ago because he was getting a lot of threats uh, from, from the law enforcement agencies. He had already sat in jail for 20 days uh, for protesting the war. He was also part of the, uh, the group that supported Alexei Navalny, which many Russians are concerned about, uh, you know, being penalized for, for voting. People also used electronic voting in the 2021 election. So people are very concerned about this crackdown. But uh, I raised this just because uh, it's just it's just one more person who's no longer going to be in Russia to be able to report about about what's actually happening. Um, but uh, I have been surprised and I've heard uh, from other friends who've had conversations. I've not had a ton of conversations with people about a support for Prigozhin and Wagner. But, uh, you know, first, when when people first started talking about why he was taking on a more public role, um, you know, everybody said, well, you know, his name recognition is like 2%. Nobody knows who he is, but it does seem that more and more people do know who he is and more and more people respect him and, and like his approach. Um, and even, uh, uh, one, uh, well-connected Russian businessman was telling me recently that, that Prigozhin is playing with fire and that he, you know, is going to become the next Navalny. Um, yeah. Uh, so and and Evan, in fact, just a week before he was arrested, uh, had told me that in in his discussions in Yekaterinburg with people, he was really amazed to see just like widespread uh, admiration and respect for Prigozhin. I think because now as this war is touching more and more people and more and more families, he's someone who, um, you know, he speaks like an ordinary he well he uses very vulgar language but uh you know he speaks like a you know someone talking to their friends um and he doesn't seem like he's in a distant uh palace uh, he he's on the front line and and he's advocating for his troops um as to your question about the 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 generation gap um I do think that by and large, yes, like I do think that, you know, it, this is heavily correlated with people who consume a lot of state TV. There are a lot of very old people uh, who do that and who, you know, feel like they lived well during the Soviet Union, feel like they have um, uh, strong ties to Ukraine and feel and I and, and also feel that uh, level of, you know, rejection from Ukraine. Like, why are we not good enough for them? Why don't why don't they want us to, you know, um, uh, and I spoke to a lot of young people, you know, who had been protesting, who have been detained, whose parents don't support them. But but I also have met people like Votanovsky and his act, his friend who are um, kind of old, you know, the older people who are very adamant that, you know, who have more life experience and who are very adamant that this shouldn't start. So I'm sorry, I don't have a scientific academic answer for you, but we can talk more. Um, the dehumanizing propaganda. Uh, yes, um, I think there's quite a lot of it every day. Um, and this negation of uh, Ukrainians' uh, existence as a separate ethnicity and right to exist as a country, something that really reminds me of uh, the Balkans, where I spent a lot of time reporting a very similar uh, discourse was used by by the Serbs against the, the Bosniaks. Um, and I do think, I mean, I don't I think this question is about the tone is is quite difficult uh for me to answer but um it's it's true that if you watch a lot of tv what you find is is very shocking and i do think that uh, a lot of violence not only uh dehumanizing rhetoric against russians but a tremendous amount of just violence in general and and vulgarity is being normalized in russia in the public discourse in what people write on telegram what they can say on tv i mean we saw this very famous um mm, uh activist Anton Krasovsky, who was paid, you know, by RT, uh, who, who, who made really disgusting comments about Ukrainian children that I don't want to repeat. Um, but, uh, 
it's interesting because uh, Levada, for instance, has done polling, and I think still the majority of Russians uh, say that they see Ukrainians as a friendly people and like Ukrainians. Um, I mean, that's because if you put yourself in their position, they are they just want to save Ukraine, you know, from from the Nazis, right? In, in which is the the, the Putin messaging, right? Uh, I've met people um, when I went out in the street on October. Eighth or ninth, when when Moscow was bombing Kiev in retaliation for the bombing of the Crimean Bridge, uh, one guy that I spoke to said, "I feel so bad for Ukraine. We shouldn't be bombing them. We should be nuking America because you know, uh, it's America is holding Ukraine hostage, and you know they're they're using Ukraine to fight a proxy war with us because they want to destroy us." Uh, so this is how a lot of people justify it to themselves and think they're helping Ukrainians. As I said, even this you know conscript like didn't want to go and. He was like, you know, why should I go and kill Ukrainians? What, what, what's, you know, do they want us there? <laughs> you know, like he, he really didn't know. Um, uh, so I do think that um, it's a very strange uh, position to be in, but but that, that's for the true believers who really believe in in the message that um, that they are that they are liberating Ukraine and saving Ukraine, and that you know if some people die, it's okay for the greater aim of of truly liberating Ukraine. And and this is a message you know that that is that is uh, being pushed everywhere you go. Um, just in Moscow right now, I went to a uh, just before the anniversary, I went to. Um, an exhibition at the Museum of the Great Patriotic Victory um, about uh, that was called Everyday uh, Nazism. And they tried to draw a line between uh, uh, Nazism in, in World War II and uh, contemporary Ukraine and very seamlessly, you know, and they have all these kind of exhi exhibits. Uh, upstairs is an exhibit called Everyday NATO Um, uh, talking about how NATO is, you know, a colonial power set on global domination that uh, has bioweapons labs in Ukraine and elsewhere and has, you know, destroyed, I think, like 36 sovereign states. And they had all these statistics. Um, and, and, you know, at the Museum of Contemporary History in Moscow, they're currently featuring an exhibition about um, why Donbass was always Russian, you know, and they kind of take, I can show you some of the photos of, of their uh, exhibit, but, but uh, you know, wherever you look now in Russia, there's, there's something trying to convince you of the legitimacy of, of, of this war. Um, the Russians in exile, there yeah. should be no fear there. And yet, this is what everybody says, um, and and I have to say I'm I'm quite sympathetic to this um, argue, the, to this argument. I think that um, there are, in my purely anecdotal conversations with people, I think they're very worried about their relatives back home facing some repercussions. They're worried about being recognized, you know, using facial recognition. They're worried about not being able to come back. Uh, I I don't want to justify them. I also think a significant number of people are paralyzed and depressed. Uh, and and uh, deeply ashamed, and um, that doesn't mean that they shouldn't be organizing. Um, but I think for many many people, it's really difficult. And I, from my own uh, personal experience, after Evan was arrested, I uh, m like many of Evan's friends immediately sprung into action. They started, you know, a letter writing campaign. They spoke to every media, and I felt really paralyzed as well. I mean, this didn't last for 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 as long as this war has lasted. Um, but uh, I do think I do know a lot of people who who are just struggling to with daily tasks. Again, uh, I'm not trying to 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 justify their choices. Um, I agree that it would be a, a, a very important sign for um, for Russia for for Western European countries to maintain their support as well. Um, I think it's very difficult also for them because. Um, there's nobody really to rally around. It does, there's no they can protest against the war, but they don't. There's right now there's, you know, the opposition in Russia is so atomized and there's no prospect um, for, for, for someone else to, to take power. Um, yeah, but I do agree with you. Um, I think that was everything think that from this be, round. Yes, it's also probably worth mentioning uh, in this context that uh, globally, the majority of people do not want to take a strong position against Russia at, at this point. So that would be mostly this Western alliance that we keep referring to that has this position. So it would probably be quite helpful if people around the globe, like Olena was mentioning, would discuss this more openly in the long run, at least. 
Um, we have time for a last round of short questions. We're going to start from there and then uh, Veronica and yeah. Yes, thank you very much. And thanks for your insights. My name is Nicholas Reeds. I'm a PhD researcher here. And I would be interested in your thoughts on the potential impact, if any, of the arrest warrant that the International Criminal Court unsealed some weeks ago against Putin and the Russian Commissioner for Children's Rights with regard to the deportation of Ukrainian children. And I think no one really expects either of the two to be arrested anytime soon, but there are some hopes linked to this that the arrest warrant might have some effect in Russia for helping to raise questions with regard to the legitimacy of the war as such, and especially um, the deportation of children, both in the Russian population as well as among the Russian military, who is obviously crucial in these um, deportation operations. So there, I would be interested to hear your impressions um, if there might be any such impact. Thanks. Thank you. Um, the question about murderers and rapists being free to go to the front line uh, made me think about how sexual violence is often used as a weapon of war. And I kind of want to, as you have explained, um, Russians have kind of become a little bit, there's more violence even amongst them. So I kind of wanted to know what is being done for women and children in the protection against sexual violence and, and such. Oh. Okay, yeah. Ulrich Schneckener, a visiting fellow here at Truman Center from, from, from Germany. Um, I'm not going to into Germany's very dubious role in all that. I can, could give a whole lecture on this if somebody's interested. Um, <clears throat> but uh, I, I'd like to share one observation and, and, and one question. The observation, um, I think I have a lot of things what you giving us the anecdotes, the, the the voices from people you've spoken with. It's a bit like if you would have done interviews in Berlin in 1943. Um, and um, so we should be not too surprised uh, that actually there is that the society, or at least what we see, what we can perceive, because of course we have always these filters um, from the society in Russia, um, that it, it, it's behaving like it is behaving, you know. Uh, and um, and also um, that's why I make this reference to Berlin 20, 1943 when the war obviously didn't go very well. The first question marks came up, but the repression of the regime started, the autocratization started, uh, the totalitarianism became even more uh, also against uh, the German society, which was not the case so much before maybe. Uh, people were less enthusiastic because the war went not as planned and so on and so on. Um, so I see some, you know, parallels here, not to, ex I don't want to make a big point too, too much here. Um, however, I think we should not forget that, um, uh, that all these narratives, which come up also in the people's voices here, they are all narratives which have been, you know, used by the regime uh, very cleverly over years and years. I mean, since 2014 at latest, uh, I mean, um, you know, this whole Ukraine Nazism and so on, the fascistic, fascist regime in Kiev and so on. That's a long story, but it starts even earlier. And I think it's an interesting point. And you mentioned Mayoleev. Mayoleev, he was one of the, you know, financer and in you know also organizer and brain behind all this in particular in the cultural industry uh, how this is set up since uh, um yeah i mean at, at the latest in the in the late uh, 2000s i would say it started very much in the in russian cultural industry to come up with all these different narratives um you know uh, which are correspond to some extent or deeply rooted in, in some of the Russian, Russian mindset uh, in the society. And so I think what, what may be a very huge task ahead is what people call the deputinization of Russian society. So which is a much broader topic, uh, which, 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 which we will have to tackle probably uh, in, in a kind of a future after Putin, I don't know, um, Russia. Uh, because the ideology may not vanish, you know, when Putin has um, has 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 vanished. My question is, sorry, I'm uh, I'm I'm not I'm sorry, I got too many ideas. 
Um, uh, my, my question is much more um, related to your journalism work. Um, what make you? What do you make out of the military uh, blocker? Uh, because it seems the mill blocks. Uh, it seems to be that uh, that this is one of the few areas where criticisms are uh, allowed to some extent. Of course, these are criticisms of different kind. You know, it's it's more like there are also more extreme voices, more radical voices. Uh, however, um, there seems to be some ambivalence. How do you deal with that? Do you do you consume this? How would you judge this? Um, because they all have a have also great audiences in the Russian society. So, how is this? Um, what kind of impact do they do you do you see here? Sorry. Yes, thank you so much for, for your inputs. Uh, my name is Vera Aksonova. I'm originally from Kazakhstan and visiting fellow here. Um, I would be also interested in, in hearing a bit more about your work in terms of, uh, you were saying reporting is, of course, becoming more and more difficult from Russia. Uh, but I assume that fact-checking is one aspect that is becoming particularly difficult. And in that sense, how do you go about that and um, whether... And how much do you exchange with journalists from Europe, but also oppositional media from Russia and other post-Soviet republics in a way, whether this plays any role in your work? Thank you so much. Thank you. So I have now, what, four minutes to answer uh, four Start questions. Um, Fact-checking and exchange. Um, I mean, we have a pretty rigorous fact-checking process. Most of what I have done has been based on my own reporting. So. Um, you know, I don't know uh, what I can say about that, but but I do have we do have exchange. We do know uh, a number of uh, uh, of journalists, Russian journalists, uh, in exile now, mostly uh, some who are still on the ground. Um, but uh, absolutely, you know, I think the longer this goes on and the more reporting that's done remotely, the the more difficult it's going to be to 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 confirm everything. But um, thank goodness for for the technology and the, the ease of communications that we have. Um, military bloggers. Um, so I was really focused on sort of on the ground in Russia. And I, we have four or five other colleagues who are working in exile and they uh, are the ones who spend most of their time uh, reading uh, and engaging with kind of uh, the, the military bloggers and, and, and what do they mean and, and the way that... Um, uh, the way that they've been trying to push uh, the Kremlin to to take the war more seriously, to devote more resources to it, to call it a war, um, even, um, but but they are certainly very uh, important and 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 powerful and 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 followed by a lot of people that 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 I meet and talk to. Um, uh, and as your other point, uh, yes, it's very interesting. I, I actually, when I left Russia at the end of March, uh, I started reading Alone in Berlin by Hans Falanda, which is about um, a small uh, cell of ordinary factory workers who decided to paper Berlin uh, you know, with calls for resistance. And, uh, it, it was just, uh, two of them. It's a real, it's, it's a fictionalized version, uh, based on a real story. It was just two of them. And they, they, uh, managed to cover so much, uh, territory with their leaflets that the Gestapo actually thought it was a really, um, really massive resistance cell. Uh, but, uh, what's been interesting for me and for me, what, what has resonated is, uh, the way that it follows uh, several different characters, probably you read the book, uh, but uh, who all interact with each other, but they're so restrained in what they say to each other and in public that they are meeting each other and saying on the outside what they're supposed to say, but on the inside, they're organizing and they're um, writhing in, in anger about the government. Um, um, in terms of sexual violence, what's being done? I mean, in Russia, nothing. Uh, when I was in Ukraine, I, I wrote uh, an article about um, a women uh, and, and men who were victims of sexual violence. And I'm afraid that I don't think Europe is really doing enough for these people who have, uh, when, when they choose to, to leave Ukraine. Um, uh, one of the women that I interviewed was settled in a small town in a in 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 a European in an EU country and uh she had sort of a volunteer Ukrainian psychologist who who talked to her every day her husband was killed and um and she was raped in the same night um but then um 
the psychologist uh, ch ch went, decided to go back to Kiev uh, once it became safer, and she more or less has no one, um, no linguistic skill, no skills in German, no job. And, um, you know, aside from uh, several volunteers who have been trying to help her, I think she's been having a very hard time. I, um, and I think Europe needs to do more uh, to provide for mental health for, for people inside Ukraine and also outside of Ukraine. Um, and finally, Lvova Belova and the arrest warrant. Um, I mean, uh, the arrest warrant was quite sharply ridiculed in Moscow. The ICC was ridiculed, you know, uh, which is easy for the Russians to do when America uh, is also not a party to the ICC. Um, uh, but something that did surprise me, I wrote a profile of uh, Maria Lvova Belova, who's been overseeing this uh, process of um, evacuating uh, what what she says is evacuating children to safety, and 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 what Ukraine and the ICC and the West uh, um, is calling the theft of, of Ukrainian children's because it is. Um, and what surprised me was. Um, how much uh, civil society support there was for her. I was calling people who are, you know, experts in um, uh, working working with autistic children, let's say children with disabilities, et cetera, uh, experts on orphanages um, and people who are, you know, politically relatively independent, who don't support the government, uh, even if they have to work with them. And um, what surprised me was, um, the respect uh, for her uh, that 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 they were sharing with me, um, uh, based on her career, you know, that because she was someone that uh, had a sort of you know, fourteen year career in 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 the field in activism and caring for children with disabilities and adults with disabilities, um, and also for um, also for her work taking um, children out of. Oh, occupied Donetsk, Luhansk, et cetera. And everybody, all the Russians that I spoke to said, like, it's not so simple. You know, these children uh, deserve to have a holiday. Yes, it's, you know, it's complicated for their parents. These are even people who are helping, uh, who are working. One of them did not want to be quoted because she still works with Ukrainian families to reunite the children uh, uh, with, 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 uh, with, their, with their parents. Um, but they all said, you know, uh, many of these children are... Um, uh, people who are in institutions, um, you know, the, it's not easy to, um, you know, to, she, one of them said, you know, it's very difficult to, to uh, teach an autistic child to take basic care of themselves. Imagine trying to teach them to listen to an air raid siren and, and go to the basement, you know, they, they don't belong in uh, Donetsk or Luhansk or anywhere else like that. Um, I am not saying that I agree with, with them, but I was surprised uh, by, by the Russian uh, civil society response um, to that. Uh, which is obviously uh, qu quite different from from uh, the feelings of Ukraine and, and quite different from the feelings of, of children. You know, my colleague Emma Bubula uh, interviewed a, a girl who had been um, adopted um, or is being fostered uh, by a Russian family, you know, and she's pro-Ukrainian. She wants to go home. So uh, there are there are, uh, you know, and there have been many reports of children who were who were kind of uh, kept in these summer camps uh, where they were threatened, you know, uh, and told, you know, we're going to re-educate you um, into patriotism, where they were told that um, we, uh, that you, you know, if you say anything pro-Ukrainian, like they said they were, they were beaten. So um, it's, it's quite alarming. And I think it's important that this issue has gotten a lot of attention. I don't know that it will help uh, bring any of the children home, but I don't think that process was working very well before the indictment either. What a note to end on. No, yes. Well, I was my my plan was to um, to to end by asking you what can we do to support your work, um, and I think we're going to have to do this conversation um, off camera. We will continue this conversation with those who have been affected by war, um, of which DUI is hosting close to ninety at this point, and perhaps share some of our research and suggestions for intervention, particularly picking up on that point that Europe is not doing enough. Um, and um, of course, keep the attention going on um, um, Evan's uh, quick release, helpful quick release. Thank you so much for, for joining us today and uh, Slava Ukraini.